Well, uh, thank you very much, Gillen, for this uh, very kind introduction. <laughs> and thank you very much to the EPFL uh, team for organizing this event. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm pleased and honored to give the first talk of the week. Um, it's quite a responsibility. It's also quite a challenge when you know that the next event in the next room is called the Hamburger Prize, uh, which sounds quite um, appetizing. And so I'm glad that some of you decided that you actually it was a better decision to talk about, and more serious business, to talk about open science. Uh, so thank you for um, sticking with us, um, and um, you will be fed, I understand, uh, anyway. So um, I will start um, this um, um, Open Science Week by talking about giving you, giving you an, an overview of um, the situation in open science. And I will, it's such a large area that I will actually focus on one particular aspect of open science, which is the transparency and reproducibility of empirical studies. But before I get to that, I think it's important uh, to disclose something about myself. I am a social scientist. Unlike you, I'm not an engineer, so um, um, uh, don't be too harsh uh, on me, please. Um, um, I'm a social scientist. I um, have a background in economics and political science. And, but I think it will be, hopefully, it will be beneficial for you because it will bring a slightly different perspective on open science. And I'm fully aware that you, some of the comments that I will make, some of the observations and some of the recommendations may or may not apply to your own um, discipline and area of expertise, but that's what makes, I believe, uh, such an event so interesting because we can compare the situation of open science in our different uh, respective uh, disciplines. And as a social scientist, I'm particularly interested in uh, a sub-area of, of uh, social science, which I call meta-research, which is research on research. Um, and it's also known as the analysis of researchers' behaviors. So um, why is it that sometimes, I'm interested in why sometimes researchers behave and why sometimes they misbehave. But when you say when they behave or misbehave, you create an expectation. And this expectation is what is a good behavior in, what is a good scientific behavior in the first place? Um, there are many definitions, but in this presentation, I consider that producing research that is reproducible is a good scientific practice, is what I consider a good behavior, right? So I will focus on the reproducibility of, of research. And I believe that this is a fundamental norm of science. What do I mean by reproducibility? Um, this um, definition is by uh, Robert Peng, Roger Peng, sorry. Um, a study is reproducible if its results can be corroborated by independent investigators using the same data and codes. It's related, slightly different, uh, from replicability, which is um, uh, the ability of a study to be corroborated by independent investigators using different data sets and different codes. Obviously, the two terms are related. Please ignore the, the comment here that it's not going to be uh, addressed. It will be addressed. I will address both reproducibility and replicability. What I just mean is that usually there are, in my experience, more, um, um, there's more research about reproducibility because replicability is even more difficult to achieve than reproducibility. So this comment being done, this leads me to formulate four questions that I will briefly answer in this talk. Number one, to what extent do researchers comply with the norm of reproducibility? Number two, why do they comply or why do they fail to comply? Number three, where do we go from here and what can you do yourself as, a, as a, an ind individual researcher, as an investigator and a member of the scientific community? And number four, does it matter? So um, I will start with my, um, um, uh, an observation of um, the state of play in the field. Um, I think what triggers this, um, this, um, this uh, presentation is the fact that there has been, in the past two or three years, a number of large-scale, high-profile projects whereby researchers in different disciplines, uh, psychology, uh, cancer biology, and economics, have tried to replicate a large number of studies in their discipline. So this is an example of uh, these um, um, high-profile um, uh, projects. This one is, uh, this is a, a study, um, an article published in Science very recently in June. 
and it's an update on the project called Reproducibility Project in Cancer Biology. And um, it's a team of uh, biologists trying to replicate um, a number of cancer studies. Um, I let you read the article in your own time, but the um, uh, take home message here is that actually the researchers were quite pleased with the studies that they tried to replicate. Um, because here they say that, so it's an update on the project, and they say that on the two uh, most recent um, studies that they tried to replicate, the investigators managed to replicate a large number of experiments within these two studies, and they were quite pleased because they expected, uh, they had lower expectations, basically. But that's just one discipline. In another discipline, the things are, do not look so good. Uh, so in a discipline that I know better, namely economics, um, this is a similar project whereby a team of economists tried to replicate lab experiment in economics. In economics. And they found that 40% uh, of um, experiments, published experiments again, could not be replicated. Is it low? Is it high? This is for you to decide. In yet another um, discipline, psychology, um, things are even worse. Um, so this is this um, article reports on the very large uh, projects in which um, two over 200 psychologists tried to replicate 100 um, experiments in the area of psychology, right? And what they found is that actually half of these studies could not be replicated. Again, is it high? Is it low? It's for you. It's not for me to say. Um, I would say simply that I think we can do better than this. But bear in mind that there, are, there is variation from one discipline to another. So it's hard to generalize and say that you know, the whole of research is uh, not replicable or not reproducible. There are uh, variations um, across disciplines. Um, I think actually that uh, the three studies that I mentioned just um, scratch the surface of things. And I think that actually they underestimate the, um, the problem, if you like. Um, this study here, uh, this survey of 1,500 scientists was published last year. And in this survey, the uh, researchers asked, uh, so 1,500 scientists, have you ever attempted a replication in your own discipline? And if so, what did you find out? I do not remember exactly how many and what proportion of scientists did attempt to, um, um, of the whole sample, did attempt a replication. But what I can tell you is that of those who did attempt a replication, 70% did not manage, did not manage to replicate the study that they tried to replicate, right? And more interestingly, 50% of uh, those who had attempted a replication of one of their own studies did not succeed. So a number of researchers seem to be unable to replicate their own work. And is this surprising? Well, think about it. Um, would you be yourself uh, able to replicate a study that you conducted, for example, five years ago? Um, I think this is quite challenging, but it's telling that 50% of researchers who attempt to replicate their own work do not succeed. And there are two key problems. Researchers who try to replicate their own work or the work of other researchers face two problems. And this is what they say, not me. Um, first is that usually they don't get from the journal articles, they don't get enough information about what was done in the first place. So they cannot, it's very difficult for them to go as far as getting results because the experiment itself is hard to replicate. There's not enough information about what was done in the first place. How was the sample collected? What, was the var what were the variables? Etc, uh, etc. Et so, second problem. The statistical significance of results rarely holds between studies. And um, it is very common that actually an original study claims that um, results are st positive and statistically significant. This is something that uh, researchers love to report. My results are positive and statistically significant. But actually, researchers who try to replicate the studies, they do not question the, the direction of the effects. They do not d question necessarily the magnitude of the effects, but very often, what they cannot replicate is the p-value, right? They find that actually the, the effect is no longer statistically, very often is not, no longer statistically significant in, in the replicated study. So 
Why do researchers fail or do, why do they comply with this norm of reproducibility or why do they fail to comply? I offer a number of, of uh, suggestions based on my own understanding of the literature. First, I would say that there is a problem of uh, inadequate in infrastructure, but hopefully this is going to change. And I'm actually quite optimistic that um, the infrastructure, the scientific in in infrastructure is changing for the better. Um, people would say, well, I cannot put enough information in my paper about the experiment because of the limited word counts. But now with digital publication, this is less of an issue. Uh, something we see very often is that, um, or that we saw in the recent past, is that there was no repository for the data, or that there was the different systems or the different software or programs used by the researchers were not interoperable. So that's, that's a, an issue that's often mentioned. And then there are intellectual property uh, issues, um, uh, the fact that um, um, some researchers do not want to share information because it's commercially, politically, or whatever sensitive. A second problem, I think, has to do with the incentive that um, are in that we are subjected to as researchers. Um, I think that the current system rewards quantity, I would say, over quality. Um, low productivity is sanctioned. Think about how people are um, hired, promoted in the university. Think about yourself. I think that inconvenient results are sanctioned. What do I mean by inconvenient results? I mean results that are not statistically significant and that do not make a good story, right? People see, a lot of researchers believe that statistically significant results make a good story. Conversely, null or uh, um, uh, insignificant results do not make a good story. And, and some journals in the past, in the recent past, didn't want to publish results or biased against studies that were, um, um, where the main result was not statistically significant. Um, conversely, irreproducibility is not sanctioned. What's, what's going to happen to you if your paper is not very transparent or is not reproducible? What are the chances that someone is going to notice and, and you know, blame you? I think that so far they've been quite low. I think that there are a number of ethical and legal obstacles, which I don't need to mention here at great length, that I previously namely. And I think that there are problems of insufficient skills among us. And a key problem uh, with this p-value thing, right? Why are researchers so fetishist about the p-value? At least, certainly, in the field of social sciences. I understand that in physics it's slightly different. Uh, I think it has to do with the misunderstanding about the meaning and the properties of the p-value. And I believe that p-values are not the reliable benchmark that many people think. I believe that p-values have become a textbook example of what I call, of, of, of what is called the Goodhart's Law, um, named after Charles Goodhart, who, uh, who is a, um, a professor of financial regulation at my alma mater, the London School of Economics. And the Goodhart Law uh, states that when the measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And I think this is exactly what's happening with the p-value. It's meant to be a measure, but now, increasingly, it's a target. Okay, I need to have my p-values lower than 0 0.05 uh, in a lot of disciplines. And think about what a difference a p-value makes. Uh, it makes a huge difference, and there's uh, uh, high stakes here. It can make the difference between introducing a new drug on the market or not. But it can also make the difference between rolling out for a government, rolling out a new policy uh, in the country versus not. So we use p-values these days to make very important decisions. Where do we go from here? Um, I don't want to dampen your enthusiasm. I think there's things that we can do collectively and individually. First, I think that research teams ourselves, we need to scale up, and then we need to scale up particularly in two areas, um, statistics to better understand, for example, this meaning of the p-value and what it does, and data science, especially when it comes to curate and, and archive and, 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 and keep a, a good record of our workflow. I think that research teams need to pre-register their studies. Uh, it's something we talk a lot in the social sciences, so increasingly people pre-register their hypothesis so that their hands are tied, and when they have access to the data, they just have to run the models that they said they would. I think that research teams need to better curate 
uh, their workflows, for example, using tools such as the Open Science Framework, which I use personally, or GitHub, and there are many others. I think that research teams, and this is the social scientist speaking here, is probably something that you will find a bit odd. I think that research teams, I would argue that research teams need to reflect on what could affect their professional judgment. Uh, for example, who gave you funding for that particular study, and is there a conflict of interest? Um, if you are funded by, uh, it might be controversial, uh, given that we're in Switzerland, but if you are funded by um, a pharmaceutical company to uh, run a clinical trial, think about the pressure and think about the conflict of interest you might find yourself in. Research teams should be well advised, and this is uh, something that I would strongly encourage, as research teams would be well advised to attempt a replication at least once um, in their career. I think it's an excellent learning technique. And does it matter? I think it does matter for three reasons, and I will finish there. I think it matters because um, this problem of irreproducibility and, and uh, insufficient rep uh, replicability is being noticed. Um, it's not just a discussion of, you know, among scholars. Um, there are uh, regularly um, articles in uh, prominent journals like The Economist, like Washington Post. So very often, if you pay attention, there are stories, embarrassing st stories, uh, for the scientists that science is uh, uh, not reproducible. There's even a number of, of bestsellers. Uh, this is a bestseller by, by uh, uh, Ben Goldacre about, about um, uh, bad science. I think it matters, secondly, because at the end of the day, the interventions, the treatments that we devise and test as researchers will be later on implemented or are meant to be rolled out to real people, right? Um, so I'm, um, as a social scientist, I evaluate interventions that are meant to be rolled out to job seekers, to pupils, to patients. And, um, you know, we have a responsibility to make sure that these people are, are you know, receive uh, a treatment or an intervention that has been uh, properly evaluated. And finally, I think it matters because a lot of us do research that is funded by the taxpayer. And um, it's a huge waste of taxpayer money to run studies, to run studies and only publish the results that are convenient to you or convenient to the funder of, of the study. Um, thank you very much. I think we have time for um, a few questions and, and uh, do stay in touch um, if you don't have a chance to ask your question or, or if you want to follow up. Thank you. <laughs> if you have questions. That was a great talk, thank you. Thank um, you. I'm curious uh, if Goodart's law is going to basically foil any metrics that are designed, what is the solution for evaluating science? Um, so I think that we can still use metrics to evaluate science um, as long as um, the metric is valid. Um, for example, I would argue that the impact factor is um, a not a valid metric if it measures, if it's meant to measure this, the, how good the research is, and I think that very often it's misused, right? I think the p-value is being misused as well. I'm not saying that we should disregard p-values. Um, I think that when we, we need metrics, but we need not just one metric. The, the risk when you introduce a metric is to rely on just one metric. I think one metric is dangerous. I would rather use a basket in, of indicators. And then you can you know, um, compare the different metrics and, and see what it says about a particular study. So have a basket of indicators as opposed to just a single metric. And the second thing is that make sure that is, um, uh, that is has, as a social scientist, I would say construct validity, i.e. it really measures what it, it's supposed to measure. Um, so if you want to measure the quality um, or if you want to measure the reproducibility, for example, of a, of, of, um, of a piece of research, you know, is the data set available, is the code available, et cetera, I think these are, would be good metrics for measuring uh, transparency and reproducibility because it has some kind of validity, I would argue.
thanks. Thank you very much. I uh, just want to underline about what you said about uh, intellectual properties in journals. And about, about what? About journals. journals. And you said it's uh, closed. I want to share with you that it's depend of the context, but it is possible to share and having another uh, open-ended. If you put it open-ended, it will be better. And uh, we keep in touch if you want more to, want to know um, about IP. Yeah. Uh, so did I say that when something is published in a journal, it becomes closed by definition? This is what I understand, yes. Um, if so, I, I must apologize and clarify that it's not the case. Uh, there are uh, open access journals, and um, so I thank you for, for bringing that up, because uh, this is not exactly what I wanted to say. 